just realized I can't even hear you guys right now. All right, I'm going to figure that out. Um, so Friday fill up. This is part two of Seven Cries of the Cross. Super excited about this. We got Ashley in the house today. Come on, give it up for Ashley. Let's go, let's go. Do you guys realize that while Jesus was on the cross, there were seven sayings or seven cries that Jesus made from the cross, and they are important to the finished work of Christ. And this series is going to lead right into Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we timed it perfectly, um, assuming that all things go well. Hold on, one more person is in the waiting room. All right. So here we go, part two, seven cries of the cross. I'm going to pray. Father, bless Ashley right now with the words to speak. Bless everyone uh, with the ears to hear what is being said. Uh, Lord, that you would stir up fresh revelation this morning, uh, that you would bring us to a place of, of discussion and discovery in your word, for there is always something new that you want to teach us. So we thank you for this teaching this morning in Jesus' name. Come on. I guess it'd be good if I unmuted. Um, I'm actually super excited today about this because not that I'm not usually excited when I teach, but I feel like God dealt a lot with me during this. Um, so I'm just kind of excited to talk about it. But the saying that I got is be with me in paradise. So we're going to read Luke 23, 39 through 43. It says one of the criminals who was hanging there <clears throat> railed at him saying, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we rightly so, for we are getting what we deserve for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. So when I think about the crucifixion of Jesus, like oftentimes I'm like super blown away by the fact that, I don't know if you realize this, but he literally said seven things. Like he remained silent throughout all of his torture, all of carrying the cross, right? Like Jesus didn't speak. Um, so he only said seven things. And the second thing that he said was to a thief on the cross next to him right? But were they really thieves on the cross next to Jesus? Some translations say that they were criminals or revolutionaries because you see crucifixion was a Roman form of punishment and it was not only horrific, it was humiliating. Um, a common thief probably wouldn't be hung on a cross also, a Roman wouldn't be hung on a cross. It's what they did usually for Jews or people that weren't of Roman descent. Um, so it's probably most likely that these people that we have always thought as thieves were actually revolutionaries fighting for Israel's oppression from the Romans. Am I saying that right? Freedom, fighting for freedom from because I don't know if you remember, that's like that was the whole thing about Jesus coming, right? Was Israel was looking for who was going to free them. Like they were looking for a king. So this was the biggest event in all of human history, right? Like in my opinion, this was the biggest <laughs> event in all of human history. Like sins were forgiven, right? Death is defeated. Um, our relationship with God is restored at this because of the crucifixion, crucifixion and the death and the burial and the resurrection. Right. But why does God like, if this was a play or a movie, this would be like the scene, right? Like this would be like, if I was directing this play, it'd be like black lights, spotlight on Jesus, you know, what I mean? because this is the moment where all this happens. So why in the midst of all of this and in this great moment, does God choose to be crucified with other people? And that kind of really has like messed with my mind a little bit thinking about it. Um, 
So I wrote, why did God of the universe choose to be crucified next to others? I believe that it spoke to Jesus's humanity and how he chose to come and operate on this earth. Just like we saw at his birth, the King of Kings entered this world with humility and he left the same way. Um, adapt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to the cross. So I think it's a beautiful picture of not only how we talk about how God is community all the time, but even that, like even in his death and resurrection, like it, he didn't do it alone right? Like he did it with, for, and with all of humanity. So I think it's a beautiful picture that there were two men, um, that were crucified with him and that it wasn't just a, um, it, it's something that could have been the Jesus show. Right. But like, he still made it about us. And I think that's the beautiful thing about Jesus is that like, we're making it about him and we're surrendering our lives, but he always turns it back around and makes it about us. And I think that's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so what kingdom are you serving? In the midst of torture, the men make two very distinct and deliberate choices. One comes to repentance, but the other doesn't just reject Jesus. He actually joins with the crowd and begins to hurl insults. So it's not even just like, oh, this guy didn't agree. He's hanging on the cross in all this same pain and he begins to throw insults at Jesus, right? Um, this shows me that pain causes one of two responses. It either causes you to lash out or it causes you to ask for help and seek a savior. Um, in the midst of these men, in the midst of these men's pain, one realizes his need for a savior and the other rejects Jesus. One is the voice of his kingdom and the other is the voice of this world. We each have choices to make every day as to which kingdom we will serve. And these two men show the differences between earthly and kingdom living. So what are you subscribing to do subscribing to today? Is it faith or unbelief? Is it profanity or reverence? Is it humility or pride? And you could go on probably with 30 million different opposites, right? like love, hate, right? Like which kingdom are you serving? Are you serving in the kingdom of fear or faith? Um, then the other thing that this really brought up for me is how does this whole story fit in with your theology? Like this man was not baptized, right? This man did not walk with God every day. Um, like he hadn't been a follower of Jesus, right? Like he or the way is what they called it. Um, so Jesus telling him that like, I'll meet you in paradise. Like, how does that fit with things that you have been taught? Um, and how does it make you feel as a Christian, as somebody that has surrendered their life? Because I'm reminded of the parable of the prodigal son. You know, the story, the one son leaves and squanders his inheritance and then comes home to be a servant at his father's house and instead his father throws him the biggest party however the older brother feels cheated and like it's completely unfair you see the one brother had done everything right and now it's as if the brother that wasted everything was being rewarded he couldn't extend grace to his brother because he had become focused on himself and what he deserved he couldn't rejoice in the fact that his brother had come home And so I just, like, I think about that, you know, and it sounds so like, yeah, it's easy. He came home, like celebrate it. But like, if I actually dissect it and think about it, like in life, like, are there times where I see other people, like maybe that I know are living in like secret sin, or I know talked some way to a certain person, but yet God blesses them, right? And then like, you're over here and like, maybe you struggle to make rent this week and you're like, God, make it make sense. Right. But 
the thing about it is you will be with me in paradise is probably the best promise that anybody could hear. Right. And like, we have to remove ourselves and out of our pride and out of ourselves and realize that that same grace that saved us is the same grace that saved this man on the cross. It's the same grace that is offered to that person that rubs you the wrong way. Right. It's the same grace. Um, it's not only the best promise anyone could hear, but it's the best promise for us to hear. It was a picture of God's amazing grace and how he's no respecter of persons. He, he doesn't hold your past against you. He's well aware of your current situation and he'll meet you where you're at. He's just waiting for you to surrender to him today. You'll be with me in paradise. The word that Jesus uses for paradise actually translates to garden of Eden. It's the same word at the beginning of the Bible, right? And now he's saying, you'll be with me in the garden of Eden, right? Jesus wasn't just saying that this man would see heaven, but rather his death would bring about paradise for us today in our daily lives. Jesus's death and burial and resurrection became an invitation to live the garden life that we were intended to. Scripture says that he came to bring us life and more abundantly, right? The state, this statement that you'll be with me in paradise was the fulfillment of that promise. It's our King of Kings, our creator, our father, welcoming, welcoming us home and offering us a relationship with him that we were always meant to have. Um, so I thought that was beautiful. And those are all my thoughts on this story. I hope it could kind of is cohesive, but God just did so many things studying for this in my heart that I hope one of them touched you. So um, I think my question is a little bit, um, we'll see if it goes, but this whole concept of paradise is now, right? That God gave us our garden life now that paradise isn't just heaven does that change the way you relate to people or even the way you evangelize does that make sense am i asking that right travis is that it makes it makes sense to me but some other people may need more cons uh context uh but let's okay. see where it, where it goes um i if I could rephrase it, I'll say yes. The, the the reality that paradise is not just a future thing, but it's a right now thing. Does that change the way you share your faith in your daily life? Meaning like when we share our faith, we are inviting people to experience something. We need to understand what that something is. Right. To make us better evangelists. Does this change the way... You, when you look at paradise right here, right now, or is it a future thing? Does it change the way you evangelize? So I think, yes, it's a great question. Um, let, let's jump into discussion. Um, you guys feel free to share um, pertaining that question, or maybe there's something else within the teaching that was really stirring you up. I like to go. I think, let me get my video on. I think, you know, for me, it's knowing that I have Christ in me and just being aware daily because my flesh will try to get the best of me. And so when I just kind of prepare myself and get ready for my day and just know that I have Christ in me, it's easier to have conversations with people and to be careful with word choice when I'm just speaking just general to them or if I'm preaching to them, one or the other. Um, I had an encounter yesterday at the mechanic shop, which is a beautiful encounter that I had with both mechanics yesterday. And I, I shared my testimony and the reason why I moved to Iowa was for ministry. And they were quite surprised in a way, um, which was good, but it allowed me to kind of share who Christ is and what he has done for me in my life. So just 
knowing and being aware of Christ in me just allows me to have these intimate conversations that would lead to me sharing my testimony and what, mm -hmm. what Christ has done. So that's just, that's my input. Yeah. I just want to like, uh, um, go with what Adrian said that the first thought that I had was paradise. You're with the father 24 seven, but in reality we're with the father here right now. And so for me, knowing that I'm in paradise right now, I feel like anywhere I go that might not look like paradise or not feel like paradise that I need to bring the Lord's presence to do whatever I can to make that area look like paradise. Mm. Change in the atmosphere. Let's go. Come yes. On. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can, I have something if, um, so that ending question that you brought up saying that paradise is here now is, was interesting to me because God is bringing me out a season of me. I was serving the flesh for a long time and there was a lot of roots that grew up in me in that. And now that he's brought me out of that and bringing me through that, um, and I used to be a fireman. I was a fireman for the last five years and dealt with stuff through that where i'm at now is it's funny yesterday all day i i, I would I, i've been struggling with fear of falling back into that sin and i've been having this word faith just come back up like i used to chase the feeling of god because that's all i knew was like this feeling of anointing but god isn't just a feeling you know and through the perichoresis i'm learning the whole trinity right now through arc mm -hmm. 101 but yesterday i was having like fear like i was like okay i kind of I kind of want to just die right now so that I can go hang out with God because I feel like I'm in a good place with him. And I just want to go. I can't, I don't want to deal with any more of this craziness. I want to go. And then it's funny that that's the ending question that you brought up. So um, I don't really have anything else to add to it. It was just, it's interesting that that's where you brought it up is that paradise is here now. And um, it kind of just helps me continue to grow that foundation that with Christ in our lives that we do have a hope and um yeah that's it I don't know it was it was interesting yeah, the no. question the statement so it is, it is an interesting concept and you know some people may not agree fully with that um right. and I think that's kind of the journey that we're on Terry go ahead I think it the way that this is presented in that paradise is here now by our choice to enter into it gives a different feeling to the the lord's prayer where it says as or on earth as it is in heaven because so many people put off giving their life to the lord because they feel like it's a far away it's a uh, in the future experience so it would give a different feel for you can have kingdom living here now and it gives it more of an appeal to those that want to okay i'm going to surrender my life to god but i'm going to do it later after i've had all my fun because I think so many people have this concept and idea that Christianity is boring and that they're going to have to suffer continuously and give up so much and not realizing so much has already been given up for them and that there's joy and there's peace and there's hope. And I don't think that they, they look at it as a right now for now thing. That's it. I kind of look at it like, like Jesus is when he died on the cross, like heaven and the kingdom was there, but the gates were locked and God was preparing that land, that kingdom for us. And once Jesus died on the cross, he was the gatekeeper and he, he opened the doors. And it's like, I, I keep thinking about how people you know, you want to go on this really great vacation and you work your whole life and you save and you save and you save until you can finally purchase that vacation that you've been planning for years. Knowing once you buy that ticket, you're like, oh, that feeling, oh, I can't believe we're going to be able to finally go. I look at it this way, like, we've already got the tickets. 
we're we're going on the best vacation. It's gonna it's already there. So that excitement of knowing that this is gonna be the best thing ever to carry that daily with me knowing like I don't you know if I have the worst day of my life it's still going to be the best knowing that that greatest vacation of my lifetime is at the end of my road I kind of look at it as and this may be like theologically not sound but I always look at it as like for me personally, like I'm living in Disneyland because God made that possible, but like I'll get to go to Disney World eventually. You know what I mean? Like, come on down, just... Ashley, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, yeah, because Disneyland's not as big as Disney World, but they're pretty much the same in a lot of ways. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's a great analogy. I think that's a great analogy because if you think about scripturally, if you think about scripturally, like what Jesus Christ brought to us here in a desolate, desolate world, he he allowed us, he removed what was the barrier, right? Sin was the barrier to our father. Like we make it about people, a lot of people think sin is the end all be all, but God just got rid of what was in the way of mm us getting close to him like because because he removed sin he was able to we were able to open his door like go into his bedroom you know what i mean like open the door to my father's bedroom jump in my father's bed good morning dad wake up we we you know you get to have that closeness with the father as before the hebrews ain't no closeness with the father they even know him as father that was the that was revolutionary when jesus said our father that was the first time that was said in reference to G in reference to God. And I just want to bring balance to it though, because it's a it's it's kind of an American version of Christianity in a sense, because as you read Travis, you went to Philip the Philippines and Guatemala and all these different places. As you as you look at other places in the world, I just read um an article of Voice of the Martyrs on how the um the Muslims have bombed in in um Senegal. They bombed this church, this little girl had her, this little girl, she's four years old, had her half her face blown off. Um, the United Nations did some type of something, whatever, they stepped in, they had her face sewn, like facial surgery, sewn back together, it was historical. Um, they, re, they reattached her face for this little kid, four, I got kids, eight, seven, one, right, and three. Like, we, we, I got saved in a hostile environment where my faith was tested by death. Are you willing to die for this? And what makes up Paul, Paul's mindset of is that, that when the first Hebrews got saved, they got saved as if like, hey, we're going to get saved, but we might die for this. And that mindset is lacking in American Christianity. And that, and that, but the paradise now, or that joy, that this, because that's what I felt when I first got saved. I was in a hole, and I got saved. I felt like I was in Disneyland, but I was in prison. Everybody's miserable, but I felt like I was in the greatest place on earth. Like, it was, you couldn't tell me, like, joy is, is real, but that joy allows us to go through persecution. Because if you really share your faith, and you really have your faith, you will be tested. People will want to kill you and, and ostracize you because of your faith. Because if they did it to Jesus, they'll do it to us. And it, it reminds me of when the when the like I said when the first Hebrews got saved, they got saved knowing that one, the heat of their own culture was going to ostracize them. Not only their own culture, the Roman nation, what they was under, was going to was going to was going to kill them. Was chasing them down. Up until what forty? Up until forty A.D. Around forty fifty A.D. So if you got saved anywhere between them and Paul, Paul was chasing you down. You know what I'm saying? So Christians dispersed because of that. That's how. That's how the gospel got saved. The more they kill of us, the more the gospel spreads. And bring, bringing a soberness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, because I only hear about this from Americans. When I hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ from 
I just heard the gospel preached from a Belizean yesterday, and he preached it so differently because his surrounding island, the, uh, not just, uh, the island he lives on, an island, his island he lives on is so demonized, and it's just so dead. But he brings the the joy and the reality of Jesus Christ. People are are dying daily, and it's just it's just a different it's a different soberness, and he's just reminding me like the joy that we get. The freedom that we get, the privilege and the benefit of being a son, there's no greater feeling than, than being a son after doing what we did and God still accept us and still give us a ring and still put a robe on us and lifts us up. Like that, that, that greatest feeling allow us to go through the darkest times in, 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 hist in history. Allow us to go through some of the darkest moments in our personal lives. It allow us to, and and another thing is, is the reason why it's boring is because Christians make it boring. We got Sunday Christians, pew warmers that the church. When if you around a person that really loves Jesus, like as us, as on fire for the Lord, it's attractive. It's attractive. I asked, I had somebody ask me the other day, "What must I do to be saved? I want to be like you. Like, what do I must? What must I do to be saved? You are happy in the middle of this horrible stuff. Like, I don't even know what I did to this dude. I was just doing. I was just walk, we're going to work. I'm just working. I'm just work, going to work, working, dealing with what I'm dealing with. And I'm just, I was listening to the listening to somebody preach, and I was excited. I screamed hallelujah at my job, and that shocked him. Because I was able to scream hallelujah in the middle of it, it, it is this desolate place that we're in. We have to make it, our joy makes it attractive. Why would, why would somebody, I always look at it like, why would somebody want to join, a, it's like a gang. Christianity is like a big old gang. Why would I want to join this gang or this mafia family or whatever if, if y'all don't love each other? Y'all not cool with each other. Y'all tripping with each other. Y'all got a thousand dominations. Y'all argue with each other all the time. Why would like, you know what I mean? The arc identity makes it, um, it brings a leveling field to the Christian body as a whole. It brings up, it preaches identity as well as like hell is real. Sin is, it will get you hemmed up, get out of that thing. Walk in sonship, walk as who you are. And it's attractive because when people talk, even when Christians talk, they are stuck in condemnation. And when they talk to, when you've been set free and you know you're a son or a daughter, you're, you're a different believer out here. I'll tell you that much. You are a different believer. And that's what sets us apart. And that's what make it that cross thief uh, revolutionary moment because I committed murder, but I'm able to come to Jesus, even though I'm right next to somebody that's been serving the Lord all day life and never have done something so hard. That's the joy of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. I think. Um, go ahead, Leah. For me, I, I, I love the scripture because it says today you will be with me in paradise. And I believe that paradise isn't a place. Paradise is a person. And that mm. person is Jesus Christ. And scripture says that he is in all things and through all things. And the kingdom of heaven was at hand. So paradise to me is here because I am in Christ. And paradise is there because I will be in Christ. And um, that's the beauty about Christ is that he is the person of paradise. He is the person of truth. Truth is a person. Salvation is a person. Paradise is a person. Righteousness is a person. And everything leads back to him. And because we are with him, it is paradise. Amen. Amen. Uh, great way to, to tie it together. Um, just for time's sake, uh, Monique, would you pray us out? And then I'm going to stop recording. And if you want to share, anybody wants to share after that, you can as well. Monique, pray us out. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, um, Lord, for allowing us to um, be up this morning and just to be able to receive uh, your word and to be able to do community with one another. Um, Lord, I pray that as we all go out um, into our day, that we take this with us, Lord, and that um, that we also be 
be a paradise for someone else to experience God that um that they may experience you through us um and we just we don't allow this word um to fall void um but we we go out and continue to bring paradise to those who might never see a vacation god um we thank you for all that you're doing um and all that you continue to do to this ministry in your name we pray amen amen